the subject of string theory is a constant source of um, amazement. Ever since it, was, it first emerged in the late 60s, it has led us in strange directions that we couldn't conceive of, and it's, un, it's, it's, it's revealed depths of mathematical structure that we couldn't have anticipated. And um, certainly, recent developments suggest that it's still leading us to places that we can't predict. And it's this excitement, really, really which motivates me and, and my colleagues. So according to string theory, the fundamental building blocks of matter at the most microscopic level are particles which are extended, they're literally string-like, and the strings can vibrate in different ways, and those different ways are manifested as different kinds of particles. The particles we're talking about are the constituents of the nucleus of the atom, the protons and neutrons, which themselves are made of quarks, and then there are electrons, and then there's a particle of light called the photon, and many other particles. This collection of particles is part of what we would like to explain in what the subject which is called elementary particle physics. According to string theory, this whole collection of apparently disconnected particles are in fact unified in the sense that they correspond to different ways in which a single object, a string, can vibrate. Over the years, as people have researched string theory, um, there have been large developments in the understanding of the structure of the theory. But one of the most remarkable features of the theory is that it seems to have a will of its own. In, in a certain sense, we can't predict the direction it's going. So that um, although one of its main aims is still to understand the nature of the fundamental particles, the scope of string theory has now shifted to something which looks actually even grander, in a sense, that it seems to be a provider language for discussing areas of theoretical physics which are far away from the area in which it was first invented to describe. Although string theory is rather far from being experimentally test testable as a theory that unifies the forces of nature, it is still remarkable that it is probably the only theory that contains all of the ingredients that one would expect if one wanted to unify them. So people are still working very hard on trying to understand its fundamental structure and therefore what its predictions are. However, uh, apart from that, one, it, it's notable that the theory itself grew out of trying to explain puzzling experimental data. String theory had some precursors in the late 1960s, uh, and probably the most striking thing that happened whilst I was a, doing my PhD was a paper by an a young Italian physicist whose name was Veneziano, which really set the scene for everything that followed. Uh, and it's, um, I will eternally be in debt to my research supervisor, Richard Eden, who pointed this paper out to me and realized its importance immediately, whereas other people didn't. Um, so starting from, this was in 1968, starting from then, I had some sort of interest in string theory. Um, but it wasn't string theory in those days. It, it, this developed into string theory in the early 70s, and I started working on it around about 1973, um, when it was a reasonably popular but not very popular subject. It subsequently virtually died in the mid-70s, not because it wasn't interesting, but because so many other interesting things were happening in the theory of elementary particles, that most people moved into those fields. And I somehow, for whatever reason, stuck it out in string theory and eventually started collaborating with John Schwartz, who was also an early string theorist. Um, we started collaborating by sheer accident in 1979. So just by chance, I started working with John Schwartz um, in the summer of 1979 when we were both visiting CERN that summer. 
CERN is a wonderful international organization in Geneva where people come from all over the world. I came from, at that point from Queen Mary College in London and John Schwartz from Caltech in California. And we just had a cup of coffee together and discussed what we were interested in. And we happened to be interested in the same problem in string theory at a time when there were virtually no other people doing string theory uh, because they were all doing what they thought were more interesting things. And that collaboration began there and at that time and continued. We kept meeting in the summers or for a few months at a time for about five years until 1984. And in that period we were developing what we called superstring theory which was a version of string theory that had some consistency, some mathematical consistency, and seemed as if it was very exciting to us, although it didn't catch on with other people until 1984. We, um, in retrospect, that's a rather good thing because that meant that we were free to work at our own pace, we didn't have competition, and we, we could you know, leave certain problems for a time and then come back to them without worrying that other people may have solved them. So we would meet um, once a year or so for a few months um, and as we understood more and more we got more and more excited about it until in 1984 in the summer when we were both visiting um, a, an institute in Aspen in Colorado we solved a problem which I think clinched it it clinched it, I mean we had already, we were already convinced by string theory, but it clinched it for, for those who may have been more skeptical because we were able to answer a question within string theory that was a question that went far beyond string theory and could not be answered by more conventional theories. It's the, the, it was a question about how certain things called anomalies which are devastating inconsistencies, are avoided in string theory. So um, as far as the world at large was concerned, that result that we showed in the summer of 84 was the thing that clinched it and made string theory instantly very popular. So having proved that the, the theory was consistent in a way that more conventional theories are not, um, that made people sit up and pay attention. And very quickly, within a matter of a few weeks, a large community of people had turned to string theory. Um, they had seen that that was probably the right, the right way of trying to approach this kind of theoretical physics. And our world changed. So having for several years been at leisure, uh, been able to work at our own pace without worrying about competition, suddenly not only was there a lot of competition because everybody wanted to find out more about string theory, but also we were called upon to give lectures and to talk at conferences and workshops. It's very difficult to put into words uh, exactly what is involved in doing research in theoretical physics. It's a sort of strange combination of physical intuition to com together with mathematics, which is quite sophisticated mathematics, um, there are concepts in theoretical physics which probably cannot be expressed in, in normal language and which have to be expressed in mathematics. But at the same time, our thought processes regarding physics have to be related to the physical world, what we see. And so um, different people have different ways of dealing with this. There are people who do research in string theory who would be classed by many people as, as, as mathematicians and not really as physicists at all. And yet there are other people in the opposite extreme who use rather little math and who try and understand things in terms of pictures much more than uh, formulae. So I, I think I'm somewhere, in, I'm, I'm somewhere in between those who, who are on the mathematical side and those who use rather little mathematics. Um, I think one of the surprising things is as the subject has developed, string theory has developed, it has incorporated more and more mathematics and in fact mathematicians have benefited from string theory as well. There's been a very, very um, fertile coming together of mathematics and, and physics 
And part of that process, as far as I'm concerned, has been my interaction with mathem mathematicians. I, uh, Ten years ago, fifteen years ago, um, I wouldn't have imagined that I would be collaborating with a purer than pure mathematician, a number theorist, which is what I'm doing. Uh, people often ask the question, what is the point of this kind of research? Um, particularly on the experimental side, which is a, a truly expensive area, um, which involves, for example, building accelerators like the LHC at CERN. Um, and that's a very difficult question to answer, simply because I think people, th when they ask the question, are thinking in timescales which are very short compared with the t sort of time scale that this kind of research might lead to obvious benefits. Um, so, I mean, one, one obvious benefit is purely intellectual. I mean, it's certainly the reason why I pursue the subject and why just about everyone I know does. Um, it is the sense of wonderment at the universe and the sense of trying to understand how the universe is put together. Um, but if you want to justify spending money then I guess one needs also to have more concrete um, uh, reasons. And um, I think it's, it's true to say that all of the huge changes in society that have been caused by advance in, in, in knowledge have, been, have come from this kind of research. So just think about electricity and magnetism um, a couple of hundred years ago, uh, to think about um, more recently the whole quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was uh, developed in the early 1920s by people who had absolutely no idea what the applications would be and no wish to, they, they didn't aim to have applications when they were doing the research, but it transformed society. I mean, everything about modern society is based on quantum mechanics, computers, and all modern technology. And so the outcome of the kind of research that we do is, of course, firstly, unpredictable. And secondly, if it's successful, will be enormous.